Cool. Well, first of all, um, I'm super happy that I can uh, join, uh, if only remotely, this year. Um, and thank you for sticking around for the probably latest section uh, talk in, in the day for you. Um, so um, today, um, I want to tell you a little bit about the distribution of IDs in the in the DHT and uh, uh, basically what properties it has, what problems it has, and then tell you about a different way of picking IDs um, that results in a much nicer distribution and potentially a much easier system to work with. Um, so um, this talk is going to be about the distribution of IDs. So it's going to be a little bit more sort of mathematical, but the outcome is that I should hopefully should have tools and knowledge how to sort of take advantage of this by the end of the talk. Um, cool. So first I want to start by telling you more about what the distribution of the current DHT uh, looks like. Um, and so for the purposes of this, uh, we can simply just assume that peer IDs are just random numbers chosen between uh, 0 and 1. So these are random real numbers. Um, the, the engineering details uh, of whether they are hashes of private keys are sort of irrelevant because we're just focusing on, on the distribution of these numbers. So um, let me start by just sort of simply asking the following question. You know. What happens if you pick a large number of random numbers in the interval between zero and one? So for instance, let's pretend that we're going to pick a thousand numbers um, in the interval between zero and one. Uh, and this box I have on the screen is uh, sort of a depiction of the interval between zero and one. Um, and if you pick a thousand numbers, you're going to see uh, a picture that kind of looks like this. Uh, so the vertical lines are the, the random numbers. Um, and you can see that they are roughly uniformly distributed visually, kind of like at the larger scale of the interval. But at the same time, if you look closely at sort of individual windows in this interval, um, there are sparser windows and there's denser windows. And so we want to understand, uh, you know, why is it that when we pick uniform numbers, we end up with a distribution, realized distribution, which is not really uniform, and how non-uniform can it be? So in order to do this, in order to understand this phenomenon, we have to have a way of, first of all, quantifying um, you know, this intuitive notion of some parts of the interval are denser and other parts are, are sparser. And so the way we do this, uh, and this is probably familiar to most of you, is we take all these numbers between zero and one um, and we insert them in a binary try. Now, I have to assume that most of you roughly know what a binary try is. Uh, so I'm just going to very briefly sort of gloss over the definition. Essentially, the idea is that, you know, if a number is on the left side of the interval, then it would go in the left subtree. If it's on the right side, it would go in the right subtree. And then you keep doing this recursively um, and you stop as soon as every number basically lives on a leaf on its own. So the try doesn't grow uh, past the point where every leaf is like in its own, uh, every number is in its own leaf. So in this case here, um, this try is what you would get for the numbers that we have on the illustration here. And you can see now that um, numbers which are in sparser regions of the interval uh, end up having much shallower leaves in the binary try, whereas numbers which are in denser regions uh, are deeper in the tree. Um, um, I won't like go into the details of why, because you can figure it out kind of on your own um just by kind of like staring at a little bit but the key point here is that the the depth of how far a number ends um so the depth the the depth of how far a number ends up in the try represents the density of the interval uh, around it the depth 
in the tree of a number is a quantification of how dense um, uh, how dense the region around this node is. Uh, so here we have the example, the red numbers. Um, we, if we want to summarize the kind of the non-uniformity of the entire outcome, so the whole interval with all the numbers, uh, the standard way to do this is to just look at um, the distribution of these uh, depths. And so uh, you're going to see a picture like this, which uh, basically looks roughly like a, a bell curve. Um, and here comes like kind of like the first important uh, fact that is somewhat non-obvious that, that I should tell you. Um, the fact is that if you do this experiment any number of times that you want, the experiment being picking a you know picking a thousand numbers and 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 putting them in a binary try, even though every single time you're going to see a different try because the numbers will be different every single time, the distribution of the depths of the leaves is always going to be the same. So this is a sort of a magical <clears throat> magical fact uh, that one can prove analytically, <clears throat> and it's quite important. Uh, in particular, it tells you that. Um, if you wanted to know the real distribution of the uh, IDs in the DHT, you don't have to go to the DHT and uh, scrape all the peer IDs. All you can do is uh, generate, uh, you know, about 20,000 numbers, which is the size of the uh, DHT network. You can, you don't need to know the size exactly. You can just roughly generate this many random numbers. And the distribution that you see in your experiment is going to exactly match the distribution of the of the real of the real thing. So um, the the analytical result that we know uh, this is like a textbook result in math um, of what happens uh, what this distribution looks like um, is even more precise than just saying that the distribution is going to be the same every time. And in particular, the result says that um, uh, the mean of this distribution is going to be uh, roughly log n. And by roughly, I mean there is a constant factor in front of log n, which uh, um, I'm not saying what it is. Usually, theorems don't give you the exact number, but you can always find it yourself just experimentally. So um, the mean is roughly log n, and, and, it, and it will be something like two or three times log n. So it's like much deeper than if the tree was balanced. If the tree was balanced, the mean would be exactly log n. Um, what's more important and more interesting in this theorem is that it actually also tells you that the deviation of this depth of leaves is also going to be about log n. So the, to interpret this uh, uh, the, this statement, it says that the variance, so it says that there are leaves that whose depth is either larger or smaller than the mean by as much as the mean itself. This is just another way of saying that the tree is really, really uh, imbalanced. Um, and this is in fact very easy to check. If you open up the DHT code and uh, look at the routing table of an individual node, you're gonna find out that like uh, oftentimes nodes have a routing table of depth 15 or 16. Um, the depth of the routing table exactly represents um, uh, where your peer ID, the, the depth of your peer ID in this imaginary binary try. And a depth of 15 is clearly enormous um, for a network that has only about 20,000 nodes. Um, so the, the lesson here is that um, the DHT uh, distribution predictably is extremely um, volatile. And um, the good news is that um, you don't um, you don't have to sort of know these theorems or like uh, find them in the literature uh, because you can always just simulate um, simulate these experiments uh, in, in a computer program 
and, and figure out exactly what the distribution would be. And to facilitate this, um, I've created two libraries that uh, we use quite a bit in the DHT part of um, IPFS. Um, the links are down below. So one is in Go, one is in Python. And um, these libraries implement a binary try so that you can uh, sort of experiment with it and so in insert uh, IDs and sort of see what happens. Um, so this is um, sort of concludes part one. Uh, which is really just telling you that, unsurprisingly, the distribution of PRIDs in the DHT is quite imbalanced. Um, now, part two, I want to tell you about a different way of picking your PRID, which would result in a significantly better distribution. So this, this way is called the, the power of two choices. Uh, this algorithm for picking a peer ID. And the algorithm simply says, um, pick pick two numbers. If you're choosing your peer ID, pick two random numbers, put both of them in the binary try, and then uh, stick with the one that ends up in a shallower location. In other words, in a less dense region of the distribution and throw away the one that ended up in deeper location. In, in this picture, the orange one ends up much deeper. You see it ends up kind of like much closer to a pre-existing number. And so you want to throw this away and you stay with the blue one, which um, nicely lands in like a empty gap in the, in the distribution. So that's just another way of picking your peer ID. Um, and there is a corresponding um, a theorem uh, that says that, you know, if you use this algorithm, what you're going to end up seeing is that actually the outcome is significantly more uniform, both visually in the, in the interval zero to one, um, but also the try that corresponds to, to this distribution would be nearly perfectly a balanced tree with some defects uh, here and there, so fairly infrequent. And if you want to represent this um, statement in a distributional form, uh, you know, you can see the picture on the right, the distribution would be something that's very skinny and focused around the mean, and it would have very small tails kind of coming, uh, coming off to the side. Now, <clears throat> The um, the actual uh, formal statement of the theorem says that if you use the power of two choices um, algorithm, <clears throat> the mean of the binary tree would be, uh, now it would be actually pretty much exactly log n, but the more interesting part is that the deviation from the mean is log of log of n. So, uh, Previously, it was log of n. Now it's log of log of n. So this is exponentially smaller. Um, uh, log of log of n is usually such a small number that you can uh, think of it as just being equal to one or two, regardless of how big, um, how many numbers you, you know, peer IDs your system sort of has. So um, in practice, what this means is that you you expect to see a completely balanced tree, which very infrequently might have uh, nodes that are either one deeper than the than the average uh, depth, or maybe one shallower than the average depth. And so this is called, uh, yeah, like I said, the power of two choices. Now, <clears throat> the question is, um, why might you care? to produce uh, peer IDs that are uniformly distributed versus uh, ones that are not so uniformly distributed. Um, so in general, there are multiple reasons. Um, depends essentially what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, but I'll give you two examples uh, just to give you an intuition of how you might use this um, more balanced tree. Um, one question that comes up a lot in the DHT world is um, how can we roughly estimate the size of the DHT network? And a natural way to estimate the size of, of the network is to um, pick a random peer from the network 
and see how deep uh, they are in the binary try. Um, so you can see that if your tree, if you, if the binary try is balanced, and you just pick a, a random uh, number from the from the network, from the a random peer from the from the network, uh, it is very likely that the depth of this peer is going to be equal to the mean, which is exactly log n. And this means that you can infer the size of the network from from this number. It would just be two to the power of the of the depth of the nodes that you sampled, uh, and and your estimation of the size of the network would be correct uh, most of the time. So ninety percent of the time. So if you if you if you want to be even more certain that your estimation is correct, you can just pick a few random numbers and just go with the majority uh, majority vote. Uh, so you can do this with a balanced distribution. You cannot do this with the current distribution in the DHT because here, if you pick a random number, uh, a random peer from the network, uh, the chances that you end up with a highly unrepresentative depth are nearly 100%, basically. Um, so this is one example of why you might want to have um, balanced uh, distribution. Okay. See you.